everybody, and welcome to Marvelous Movie Mondays with Kelsey and Dill. Guess which one's which? You can't look at the names down below. Um, just kidding. <laughs> uh, Kelsey, how's it going? Uh, this is our first like regular episode in quite a while because we've been doing commentary. Yes, it's nice to just like. Honestly- wind back the clock a little bit and go back to our roots what's up no yeah for sure dale i felt that as i was taking my notes i was like wow i haven't cracked this notebook open in a minute since we yeah. ended our um um x-men animated series watch so it was yeah. uh it was good to jump back into old habits you know what i mean mm-hmm. yeah and and we are still in the retrospective hence why we're doing a video on a movie that came out 10 years ago but it's nice to kind of like just be able to talk about it for like 40 minutes as opposed to like two and a half hours of Oh, and then Cap just threw his shield again, <laughs> you know? Um, right, but, right, it was right. Fun. Um, if you haven't checked out our retrospective uh, commentary tracks on Captain America and Winter Soldier and Guardians of the Galaxy, those are out for you all to peruse with your ears and eyes if you want. Um, but don't use anything else. All you need are your ears and your eyes. You don't need to taste us, feel us, any of that. That's that's slightly yeah. prohibited. Um, strictly prohibited and slightly, I guess. Um, we're recording it's this. Slightly. Late, but... Slightly prohibited. <laughs> we'll allow it uh, sometimes. It depends on who <laughs> Who you are. Depends uh, on how we're feeling. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, uh, welcome to Marvelous Movie Mondays. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Kelsey, I, I forget how we even start these shows. Uh, we are talking about the TASM 2, uh, the Amazing Spider-Man 2. Yeah. Um, uh, ironic because we haven't, or not ironic, but weird because we haven't covered the first one on this channel. But, like, we talked about Garfield a little bit when, like, No Way Home came out. So, like, we've, like, kind of circled yeah. around it. But we've never talked about, like, any of, like, the Toby or Andrew movies, really. So this is going to be kind of our first foray into that, um, which right. is exciting. It, it's it's a cool little leap. Um, God, I shouldn't say anything that involves leaping, jumping, or falling in, in the sense of this film. But, mm. um, but yeah, we're, we're jumping right. into The Amazing Spider-Man 2 in just a bit. But um, first off, Kels, like, how's your week been? How's your month been since we haven't, like, talked, talked, talked? Um, and how, uh, uh, what, what is, like, the best thing you've seen this week? What, what have you been watching lately? Catch us up. Um my hmm well i gotta my week's been okay my week's been good my week's been okay it went from okay Um, to good back to okay that's okay well i have some family in town my grandpa is up from florida so i haven't been like i you know i've been having a lot of family time so i haven't had a lot of me time to just like sit and watch something and all the me time is getting eaten up by playing video games because now that i live back in my parents house i have access to my xbox which i don't in my apartment so so what's the best thing you played this week um i so actually this ties into one of the better things that i've watched recently which is the new fallout series on amazon prime okay um which if you're a little uh uh video gamer uh you would really like that series a lot especially if you've played the games and so Mm -hmm. i've played fallout 4 and that's how i that was my introduction to the fallout games but my brother got me onto playing fallout new vegas and so i've been playing that a bunch for the first time um nice. and it's and it's fun i'm having a good time <laughs> nice. um did you so that is the best thing you watch this week as well as the fallout series you would say yeah yeah it was oh. really good yeah i haven't been out to the theater in a while i mean I, I saw inside out too about two weeks ago but i need to like get back to the theater there's a new Shyamalan's daughter made a movie the watchers i mm-hmm. need to go see um and now uh this weekend the bike riders came out which i still need to go see so like uh also starring some some mcu and, and marvel folk you know uh, tom hardy um mm-hmm. but i i really i really do need to get to the theater to see some stuff especially because like the summer just keeps trucking along we're getting quiet place in a week like we're getting a lot of stuff yeah so that's um really exciting. It's, it's pretty pretty heavy but i i have been watching movies for this retrospective perspective and this is a good time to check in on the retrospective because i'm going to be doing picture this so I, I will save some of those titles for that but um some recent films i watched for the first time for 2014 that i had never seen before um life itself the uh documentary about uh roger ebert my favorite film critic of all time the the guy who really inspired me to do this type of film criticism which is like sitting next to someone and talking about movies rather than just writing down your feelings and thoughts which i also love but mm-hmm. um just kind of the uh, the magic of a shared experience like that and, and just enthusiasm about film. If you're enthusiastic about art, uh, any type, but especially film, uh, check that one out. It's great. Um, and then a movie called Two Days, One Night. It's a uh, Belgian film, I believe, um, starring mm. Marion Cotillard. She got nominated for Best Actress that year for it, so I figured I'd check it out for the first time. Very unusual premise and, and pitch. Basically, her she had an incident with depression at her workplace and she basically left her job and came back uh but when she came out she came back there was a surplus and um uh, the boss basically said okay if you want your job back we can pay you but then no one's getting a raise or 
we can fire you and everyone will get a raise. And so they have a company vote. And of course the majority votes to fire her and keep their money. But then it, it's kind of the, throughout the movie, she has to visit. It's almost like a 12 angry men thing where like juror by juror, they all change their minds. Like she has to visit each person at their house. And of course, cause it's France, she doesn't call them up or text them or anything. She like goes to each of their houses and like, pleads her case as to why she should get to keep her job and why they need to vote again to try to get a, mi- a majority vote. And it's just about this mm-hmm. woman stand up for herself for, you know, her job, but also dealing with this depression also, and not necessarily wanting to be antagonistic in these people's lives. Cause she sees with every person she visits, why they also need the money. So it's this really cool, like morality play. Um, and honestly kind of would work really well as like a theatrical play, but um, I really liked it. It was just one of those surprises that I was like, this has good reviews. Let me turn it on. And it ended up being like an awesome, awesome movie. So uh, two days, one night uh, and life itself are my two recommendations. So go check those out uh, and keep checking my yeah. letterbox people out there because uh, I'm going to be posting all these reviews for movies that came out 10 years ago um, as I watch them, uh, including, the one we'll talk about today, which is TASM 2. Before we get into that, Kelsey, any Marvel news or any Marvel anything? Nothing I've heard about or, or seen yeah. online. Nothing crazy. Yeah, they've kind of kept things a little under wraps recently. Uh, the only thing I did see is that Doctor Strange, or I keep calling him Doctor Strange, Benedict Cumberbatch confirmed yesterday he will be in the next Avengers movie, which we figured, but he did confirm huh. he will be in it. Um, and they start shooting that soon, so that's exciting. We don't really know wow, if that, what I, that's going to be. I wonder <laughs> um, what it's going to be about. <laughs> I don't think it's about Kang anymore, but uh, even right. if it is, or if they're just moving right to Secret Wars, I don't know. He said they're going to be starting that soon, uh, but he will be back for Avengers 5. So cool. Can't wait. Figured we All would right. see him because he didn't have like a real sense of closure in the way that a lot of other characters like Hawkeye or Thor did. Um, even though I do think we'll also see Thor right. again. Um, and but technically, let's talk about- we could... Sorry, I was just going to say, technically, we could see him in a third doctor strange installment too even yeah yeah you know, i mean I, I think gonna, the door's gonna get like a yeah. trilogy yeah, I, think, I think the portal's still open for him uh if you will so um i don't right. think we're seeing him go away anytime soon speaking of the imitation game came out 10 years ago which was like my big introduction to benny so uh very oh, very exciting we'll be talking movie. about that on picture this picture this is such a stack slate we're talking about that we're talking grand budapest hotel birdman boyhood <laughs> selma um theory of everything whiplash i mean what a great great slate damn um, yeah, very good slate. Uh, do you have a favorite of that that crop that I've listed off very quickly? I mean, I think it's got to be the Imitation Game. That was such a crazy movie, and he cool. does such a good job. And it's I just like also science love like nerds, war nerds, the... and queer nerds. Yeah, yeah, they really <laughs> hit all the nerds all the in bases, all yeah. one go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, so. all the nerds. That's all the category of nerds. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if you're in a war stuff, math stuff, or gay stuff. You covered. You're covered. This is the you're film not in any of that. You're probably gonna hate it. Um, Mm-mm. no, no, no. There's still a lot to enjoy. If you're into movies, that's the other type type of nerd, and that's who we are. Um, speaking that's of nerds, though, go. Peter Parker, a big nerd, yeah, big old nerd, big old goofball, big old razzmatazz, scallywag. He, he is. Um, yeah. I've gone on the record saying I think Andrew Garfield is the best actor to play Spider-Man. Not necessarily the best Spider-Man, but um, definitely the best actor to play Spider-Man. Um, so mm-hmm. I was very excited to just revisit this to see him and now two-time award winner, Academy Award winner since this came out, Emma Stone, um, in The Amazing Spider-Man 2. Oh, yeah. um, how, how we're going to do this, we're going to kind of review the movie, but we kind of looked at it in a different lens. We kind of took a page out of like the Framework book to kind of like look at it from a very specific lens, almost like a rubric, because I feel like with time, people have either come to really defend this movie or really hate this movie. It feels like Mm. there's not a lot of people who are like very mid on it. Everyone's either like a big defender or a big like, offender um which i think is very interesting because i i first time i saw it i was very mid on it so i think it's really interesting Mm -hmm. to see where the pendulum has kind of fallen but there are elements that i think are very good and and very bad and i am very excited to talk about it but um we're kind of going to look at it in a grand scheme of like let's talk about the acting and casting like what does that do right or wrong and does that succeed then we'll look at like the actual writing and the story beats and what like the plot actually is and the way they juggle those storylines then we can talk about Mm -hmm. just the actual action of it like is it exciting is it stuff we've never seen in a superhero movie does it show off the web slinging very well and then we can talk about like the filmmaking just like how is it well edited is the visual effects good the sound whatever Uh, and then like the last part which is kind of something you can't look at unless you're looking at it in retrospect which is the legacy like how does it work now that we have had no way home (laughs) Now that we have seen what Spider-Man has become since with also the Spider-Verse movies, you know, what does that do to this film? Does it make it better or worse? So I think it'll be fun to talk about. But what were your big thoughts, Kelsey, watching this? Had you seen this before? I assume you had. But were you rewatching this now for like the first time or, or what? Yes. So back in 
um what year was no way home coming out 2021, 2021. Mm-hmm. so back in 2021 i had watched um all of toby's movies and then these two andrew garfield's movies in preparation for no way home because there was a the big hullabaloo that they were going to be in it spoiler alert they they were and even um, if they weren't their and- villains were advertised too as well so yeah. it, it helps to know even though it's very different who electro is you know right. um who who the lizard is you know Exactly. And so I had made a YouTube video discussing, you know, who I thought the best Spider-Man was. And, or, you know, I didn't really, like, say who I personally thought the best Spider-Man is. uh, But I was just kind of discussing the discourse behind what everyone was talking about, you know, comparing the three of them. And so I watched this one about, like, three years ago now. And... This on this rewatch, I feel like I kind of really took the rose colored glasses off and was able kind of kind of to see all of the reasons why people will critique this film. Yeah. And I'm like, you were able you know to look what? at it as I a critic, it. not a not a fan necessarily. Yeah. yeah. Because I think I what I really just liked about the first one is that I didn't mind that it was a different take on Peter Parker. I know that it's like a, a little bit unfamiliar. And that's the biggest complaint people have about it is that, you know, Andrew Garfield's Peter Parker is a little bit more like he's a little bit more cooler, a little bit more like edgier, kind of like moody, angsty, if you will. He's and, not as awkward. You know, it's, yeah, not an awkward nerd wearing glasses. You know what I mean? And so I, you know, I appreciated that element and obviously like hit the chemistry that he has with Emma Stone is just like crazy. So I, you know, I walked away from the first one being like, oh, that was, you know, that was great, whatever. Did you, and then did I you watched rewatch the first one for this one as well or no? Just No, I didn't. Okay, yeah. No, me neither. I just I'm, I'm wondering if that would work differently. But that's a yeah. plus of this film is I don't think you have to know the first one necessarily, but um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, because what was your... The- I mean, the only real tie to the first one is that, you know, Gwen Stacy's dad dies in the first one and that right. they kind of, he's kind of having the flashbacks of um, what's his name? He's the voice of the saber tooth tiger and yes. I see um, Dennis Leary. Yes, Dennis Leary. <laughs> I, couldn't think I of love how name. that's what you pulled. You're I like, <laughs> you're, you're like, that's like, yeah, John Leguizamo is he, always going to be to the slot. You know, it's just always Yeah, literally. Yes. Everybody loves Raymond. What's that? No, that's Manny the Mammoth, baby. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, yeah, he keeps seeing flashbacks of his character, and that's really the only tie to the first one. So it didn't right. really affect, I feel, my thoughts and opinions on this mm-hmm. one. But this one I walked away from, Dylan. I was like, wow, that movie was like kind of a mess. Okay, yeah. So so let's get into it then. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I think the best part we can start with, because um, it kind of sets the tone for everything else, is the acting and casting. Because yeah. we, we you even just mentioned it right now. I think the reason these movies do work, because I, I, I'll, I'll say right now, the first time I watched this, I really liked it. And I didn't get why everyone hated it as well. Second mm-hmm. time I'm watching it, I am more critical of the things that don't work, but I also love the things that do work a lot more. Being Andrew Garfield and Sally Field, Andrew Garfield and Emma Stone, Andrew Garfield and Dane DeHaan, basically anyone he is mm. interacting with in a very non Spider Man related way mm-hmm. is some of the most beautiful acting work in a superhero film in the last 10 years. I really genuinely think so. Like, I think the casting, and, and you know, you can't necessarily chalk this film up for the casting of Andrew Garfield, Emma Stone, uh, Sally Field, um, because they were in the first one as well, but mm-hmm. just the way they interact, and, and, and this is something we see with all three Spider Man couples, is like they did date while they played these roles. Um, Two of right. them are still together, Tom Holland and Zendaya. But like, it's very interesting that all three of them rooting for them dated at the time. I believe Toby and Kirsten dated. They're the only ones I'm a little sus, sus of. I don't know if they did, but they were at least probably hooking yeah. up. Um, but like, they are Andrew Garfield and Emma Stone. Like, I think they genuinely love each other when they're doing these scenes, you know. And it makes it really, yeah. really interesting. Um, and it really is the crux of the movie. I think when people leave this movie, they don't think about. Oh, some of them do think about the bad stuff and, and the stuff that doesn't work and the clunky stuff, but I think most people take away that relationship, especially what they decide to do with Gwen's character. But well, what are your thoughts on just their relationship and their their dynamic? And, and I guess Andrew in general and his acting with everyone else. I mean, the acting itself, like this, I, I kind of went about the categories and like kind of like rated them based off yeah, of how strong I thought that they were. And this is easily like acting and casting for me is easily a five out of five. Like it's okay. everyone, everyone does a fantastic job in this film, Andrew especially. I also just think that everyone, like casting wise, just like the actors just work like 
Jamie Foxx does a great job as Electro. Like, interesting. We'll talk about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. And and this could also, spoiler alert, be kind of in the legacy impact thing of like I think we've seen him do a better version of Electro, but we'll talk about it. Okay, and for me, the second best actor in this movie after Andrew is obviously Sally Field. My only complaint oh. about um, Sally Field as Aunt May is that I didn't get enough of her. I yeah. I wanted more. She's she's definitely and in bits and pieces. Not not she's not as big of a role as Aunt May is in Spider Man Two, the Raimi film, or Marissa Tomei is in Spider Man No Way Home. Yeah, you yeah. know. And it, yeah, and just like watching this film, Dill really makes me reflect on like Tom Holland's movies because they're the most recent ones and the ones I rewatch the most. Right. And I'm just like, wow, they are like really, really different from the vibes that like Toby and Andrew like kind of set for the standard yeah. of like a right. Spider Man movie. You know what I mean? Well, yeah. And like, because Toby and MJ are very, or Toby and MJ, Toby and Kirsten, there's almost like an awkwardness at first between them. Like he's almost too, he, he doesn't know how to talk to her. And we kind of get that with Tom and Zendaya, but a little bit more manically nervous. Like I think Tom, mm -hmm. uh, Toby and Kirsten, it's a little bit more like quiet nervousness. And Tom Holland's approach to Zendaya is a little bit more nervous energy. Whereas yeah. Garfield has no problem. Like I, I love the moment where like in graduation, where he just like swoops in and, and starts kissing her. And like the part where he like yeah. writes, I love you on the bridge and then swoops in and takes her because that's the type of guy he is. And it's a very different Peter Parker. And I really appreciate that. He's almost like, the high school jock nerd, you know, in a way yeah. um, that I think really, really works. Like I love their chemistry. Actually, my second favorite, uh, actually, I don't even know. She might be my favorite is Emma Stone. I just think she's incredible mm. in everything she does, but especially here, mm. just you have to like her and root for her even more than him in a way. Cause you need to mm -hmm. understand why she, she <laughs> needs him to let her go and why she has to essentially break up with like the moment where she's like, I break up with you. You don't break up with me. I break up with you. Because yeah. you're the one who's inconveniencing me type deal, um, which I think is very, mm. very interesting. Um, I think she has a lot of agency and that's a big thing about her character that they do a really good job in is making her, giving her the agency, even if she's not right all the time. Like she's ultimately responsible for her death because he tells her to leave. She says, no, she says, I'm going to stay. She's responsible right. for that. She but literally it is her says, choice. Like, this is it's my choice. Agency. Yeah, and I love that in a in a female character, especially in 2014 before we would get Captain Marvel and Black Widow. You know, like it's mm. really cool to see like, this is the first really big stance a woman has had in a superhero movie, I feel, except for maybe yeah. a few glimmers of Black Widow. But even then, you know, I, I think this does a really good job with her yeah. character, but her casting especially. It's such a good role because they didn't do it well in the Raimi films, the Gwen Stacy character. It always seemed like you wanted him to end up back with MJ. Um, and there's, mm -hmm. I think, a conscious reason why. And I think they were going to bring MJ into the third film when, when we talk about it, we'll talk about the third film that never happened, but um, Shailene Woodley was going to play MJ in this, in this universe. Mm. Um, but I like how they started yeah. us with Gwen. Cause then it doesn't seem like she's an obstacle. It, it made the franchise feel fresh. Cause it wasn't married to what Raimi had done. Cause there was no MJ. It was all about Gwen. Um, but this Gwen is just so like Emma Stone. I can't say enough about her. I, I think this is one of my yeah. favorite performances of hers, this film specifically. Yeah, Dill, I really have no complaints about their acting. The only problem that I have with their relationship in this film is that it just feels like, I don't know. And I think my one of my complaints overall about the movie is that it feels like there's like three different movies happening all yeah. in one movie. And yeah. their kind of through line is like the romantic comedy. Like every moment that they have is like, obviously they're in this like will they, won't they kind of space. Um, where they've broken up now in the beginning of the movie, but now they're just kind of like, they decide halfway through they're going to be friends, and then they're, you know, obviously in like a gray area Can't where do they're that. doing the yeah. back and forth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I was just kind of like, I don't know. I just thought that it was really messy with yeah. everything else going on. I thought that if there was going to be an introduction of two villains, then that their relationship should have been stable and there shouldn't have been like a breakup. Like obviously yeah. you can have yeah. the, the conflict of, Oh my God, I'm Spider-Man. I'm going to constantly be putting this girl in danger without having this like really tumultuous relationship. Or if you're going to have this push and pull between them, I'll eliminate one of the villains. And so, so right. there isn't 
too much going right. on. You know yeah, I mean? and, and it's very interesting because like this is kind of what people said about Spider Man Three, the Raimi one. It's like you just got them together at the end of the last one. She left her wedding for him, and then the third one, they're breaking up again. Um, and I mm-hmm. think that's a very sequelitis thing to do. It's what they do between Jurassic World and Jurassic World Two. It's like, oh, Chris Pratt and Bryce Dallas Howard are, are fucking now, and they're they're together. Great. Next movie, we haven't talked in six months. You know, it's like oh, mm. like, it's like all the yeah. whole first movie was them getting together. So now the second movie, it's like right. we're gonna split them apart just so they can get together again. What I like about this, though, is that I guess they do get back together. Obviously, she dies, but it's like not until the very, very end where they get back together. Like, it's a very different type of breakup. It's not one where they're like, I don't want to talk to you or like it was bad. It, it, they still try to be friends and, and they show how that can't be. Um, so mm. I, I think th- though they take a break and break up, they really are still together in a way, which I appreciate. Um, but the thing is, like, as much as I agree, and we'll talk about it in a sec with like writing and the story beats. Like I still love mm-hmm. those scenes though, where he's like, we got to like discuss the boundaries. And then she starts giggling. He's like, mm. can't do that. Can't do like that. Mm-hmm. Those moments to me just feel yeah. like someone took a camera and we're just observing the two of them. It doesn't feel like acting. It's so real. Like when they're in the utility closet and he's like, this is, this is like such a cliche place. Hide. She's like, Shh, pay attention. Like that is yeah. some of the best acting. It's just cause it's real and it's raw. And it's, yeah. I think even more real than what to- Tom and Zendaya have because they are still so young and they're playing up that like nervous, like first crush thing. These two feel like adults. And like, I kind of like that. Yeah. I-, I feel like it feels more mature. And so they communicate in a different way than you see typical Peter Parker dweeb high school teenager does, or you see like these adults, like Iron Man, you know, it's a very interesting middle area. They're college. We don't see a lot of superhero, you know, movies yeah. take place in the college phase, which I really like. The, yeah, well, that that was also phase. one of the comments that I made in my notes. I was like, they look really old for being yeah. high school seniors. Like, right. they needed to like do like a like six months later title card or something like pop up to make like how they looked made make sense. Um, but that was just like also one of my complaints about it is that like I feel like the the beats of their relationship were kind of like oddly paced because they you know they start um the you know movie with the high school graduation he swoops in they're lovey dovey she they, he's getting pulled in to take like the family photo in the beginning and then all of a sudden i blinked and then the next scene he was breaking up with her and i was like i literally right. had i went back and i was well, like Did it, was I that miss night. A, a, it was the night scene? of graduation it's you're coming to dim sum right. with my family in chinatown right and he's like yeah I'll be right there he gets there and he's like i keep seeing visions of your of your of your dad and i, I can't and it's like what like yeah 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 let's talk about the story beats because i feel like the story beats in writing goes hand in hand with the casting because like when we talk about electro we'll talk about his storyline but yeah i think mm-hmm. the problem with this film if there's a big problem with this film is that it does feel like three films in one it feels like you have the really interesting story about his friend turning evil because of his father's dying and, and being greedy, the Harry Osborn stuff. You've got the other mm. thing about the, the, the Max Dillon stuff, obviously when he feels he's not seen and then he can finally feel seen again, but it's in a hazardous way. Um, and then you have the romance. Like, I feel like each of those things, and then you also have the, the parental stuff too, which kind of ties into everything. And I guess that's kind of what they're trying to tie the whole film together with is opening mm-hmm. up with this big scene of like, Oh, there's a secret and, and what's your father's deal. And I really like that scene with Sally Field and, and, um andrew garfield where they talk about the father and stuff but that Mm -hmm. that that is i think what they try to make the through line the problem is i'm always going to be more invested in their relationship than i am max dylan's story or harry osborne's story i just am Mm -hmm. that's just naturally because i think personally i don't love jamie fox in this role i think he's i i don't know It, it feels like for a guy as smooth and slick and cool as him playing that role it's cool to see an actor play against type but they don't do a good enough job really you mm. know showing that full transformation to where when he becomes evil all that nervous energy is gone it's like immediately he's going from like oh thank you here come, come come in the elevator i'm this meek little like timid guy and then i have electricity and you wronged me it's like a very big yeah. 180 it doesn't feel like it's that same nervous guy in the electro suit and I get the whole thing is like he died, Max Dillon died, and Electra was born type deal. But then make it more emphasis mm-hmm. on that, like have it happen in the moment rather than like the next scene. It's a totally different transformed character, and he looks atrocious too. I hate the design of it, which also doesn't help. But um, yeah, I mean, obviously, like the CGI of it all is like very. It's you know, it's ten years old at this point, which mm-hmm. is like fifty in like technology years. Um, 
But I think what the point you're making, Dill, because I I agree with you. Like, I feel like his plot line was completely fumbled. And I think that has more to do with the writing and the storyline and the beats and less to do with Jamie Foxx. Maybe it's a combination of both. But I just feel like his transformation, he goes from, like, obviously this, like, very, like, shy, you know, very meek person who, like, doesn't have friends. He, you know, he gets surprised and people remember his name, like, the moment when he has with Emma Stone in the elevator at the beginning of the film. And to all of a sudden, like, you know, he spends about 10 seconds, like, fumbling with his electric powers, yeah. being like, no, sorry, it's not my fault, please don't, to then all of a sudden being like, oh, well, actually, screw all of you. When in reality, I feel like the heel turn should have happened pre-powers. Like, he should have been getting told constantly, like, oh, like, you're never going to make something of yourself. You have no power. Like, you're mm. you're basically invisible. Like, there should have been more bj novaks in the world to Mm -hmm. be like constantly like putting him down like you know little things like bumping into him and like you know well you know what what you know it feels like to me is is and i always love to bring up the show because it's one of my favorites degrassi it feels like the school shooting episode it feels like the kid who was constantly bullied and picked on Mm. and then everyone's laughing at him because he looks ridiculous and then he just shoots people and it's like and and I know that's a very dark subject matter to tackle, especially in 2020, in 2014, but even now, even more so in 2024. But if you approach it from that point where he's just so depressed and feels so alone that he just like doesn't know what to do and you play him more subdued where like it just kind of comes out of him as more of like a nervous energy, like a deflection, that's different mm-hmm. because it, it feels so like he like he's really commanding his powers and it should be more like he's absorbing him and he's like, I'm charging up. It should be more of like a... Like, I don't know what to do. Like, like you almost don't want to go near him because he's like, okay, calm mm-hmm. down, calm down, put down the gun type deal. Um, but obviously the school shooting comparison might be a little too raw, but then you could even take a, the frozen approach of like, that happens where he accidentally hurts people and he realizes it and he runs, he goes away. But when he goes away, he sets some sort of electricity thing in his wake. You could play at that angle. It feels like they take the yeah. very, the, the worst route with his character. It's like, you could have taken it either the really tragic downfall of like the school shooter route or you take it the Elsa route where he just leaves and runs and everything starts to deteriorate because of his absence maybe he drains the electricity from the city as he runs and they need the electricity yeah. to work so they have to find him and battle him like there's so many different avenues I feel like they could have went with and then they try so hard to make this very late in the second act reveal of like now Norman Osborn's going to be another villain kind of right. takes precedence and then we kind of forget about him for a good chunk of the movie you know i, I just think it's it's juggling way too many things in even sloppier way than spider-man 3 did spider-man 3 at least like okay venom was related to gwen stacy or was dating gwen stacy so there was that love triangle aspect and then there was also harry because of the previous movies we understood why he was getting involved and then sandman's tied to uncle ben everything was still tied together here it doesn't tie together and they're trying to tie it together with the parental stuff with what happens to his dad and mom, but I don't think that's Mm. clear enough throughout until Mm -hmm. the end to where I don't understand where all these things are going to fit together. And it kind of is what's on his wall in his bedroom. It's all these pieces fragmented where he's trying to make sense of it all together. But if you look at it, Mm -hmm. it's just one big mess. It's, it's not right. You know, there's that post-it note that's like, can this work too? And it's a picture of Gwen. It's like, no, that should be what it is. It shouldn't be the two. That should be the crux of the movie. If that's what you're going to make your movie, if the movie's building to Gwen's death, that's got to be your one big focus and then give us one villain to combat that. I think that's Mm -hmm. the issue with, with at least the balancing of story beats. Yeah. What, and what my biggest complaint about the Max Dillon storyline is that, like I was saying before, like, even though he was getting picked on a lot and like, you know, he was, you know, seeing himself as a very like meek and like vulner, um, like invisible person, he never got angry with anyone. Like he never, like he never showed a sign where he was like mad or anything. Like he didn't have that turn. Like he was always like nice yeah. to people if they treated him like shit right. so when he became evil all of a sudden post getting his powers that's what threw me off like it's just like the sudden transformation the 360 flip in like how he viewed the world and he was like oh but now i have all this power and like this is i was like well was that really your goal in the beginning as a character was to have yeah. power because that's not what it came across as mm-hmm. or you know what i mean and yeah. so i just completely think that his his through line was was a mess and i and i even though i really liked the moments with harry like it just kind of felt like 
also because it was getting overshadowed by the Gwen Stacy plotline and the Max Dillon plotline that it just like kind of felt like really like overlooked and forgotten yeah. almost. Yeah. And then when it was the main focus, everything else felt like it wasn't being given. It almost felt like it halted the film in its tracks. Now, what I'll say, right. and this is back to our first talk, talk about the casting, I think Dane DeHaan's actually pretty good. Like, I think he sells mm -hmm. it well enough. I, I know a lot of people watch this movie and were hating on him, like, saying he's the worst thing ever. But also, you gotta remember, like, the Spider-Man trilogy that Raimi did was so popular, and people couldn't think of any other character as Harry, except for James Franco, who, like, nowadays, in retrospect, like, you know, fuck James Franco. But, um, you know, but at the time it was like, no, you, you can't recast Harry. Like th there's no other Harry. And I think that's the thing that worked so well with Aunt May is because Aunt May is so old in the Raimi trilogy, whereas Sally Field is much younger. She's still old, but she's not old, old. And she's, mm -hmm. she's, you know, she's less grandmother, more like great aunt, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. and, 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 and that's what it is. Aunt May. But, uh, and then Marissa Tomei, they right. go even younger. And I think they do a good job, ver you know, making those feel versatile. Same with, okay, we can't have MJ. So we're just going to do Gwen instead. We can't have Toby. Let's do Andrew. who's just a totally different type. I think the problem with Harry is that Harry's still written as the same character mm. and people didn't want to separate Franco from their brains. But I do think Dane DeHaan does a good job. He, and he looks like our friend Bart at, at certain moments where I was like, he <laughs> yes, looks like Bart. Yes, he um, does. No, but, but I think he does a good enough job and it sucks because I feel like all his stuff is kind of overshadowed, but I think he mm. gives a much better performance than like uh, that 70s show guy gives as Venom in Spider-Man 3. I forget his name. Oh, Toby. Um, Toby. Toby. Topher, <laughs> Topher, Grace. Grace. Topher Grace. There you go. There you go. Um, um, but yeah. Yeah, but even still, Dill, like, I think that his take on Harry and the whole, like, vibe and, and aesthetic of his Harry is completely different from James Franco's right. Harry. So I didn't, I, you know. Yeah, I, I think I it's because guess... it's, it's people wanted James Franco's Harry, <laughs> yeah. in a way. Like, they yeah. were fine with Andrew doing his own thing. They were fine with Gwen being a different thing than MJ. They were fine with Aunt May being different. But when Harry was different, for some reason, they wanted James Franco. And I really don't know why. And I really liked this kind of like odd pairing of like really good friends between him and Andrew Garfield. Like, yeah. I just thought that they, I think that Andrew Garfield can just like act well with like a brick yeah. wall. And, he, and I think that's like, why the know, movie just... works so well too is, yeah. and, and this is one thing now we can talk about like the action superhero nature. It's not nonstop action. They take a lot of time to just have these human beats. I think he spends mm -hmm. more time with his backpack and, and jacket on than he does in the Spider-Man suit. And I really appreciate mm -hmm. that. And I think that's what makes this a better movie than people give it credit for is because they do take the time to give those scenes between him and Gwen, but between him and Harry as well, even between him and Max. I mean, their first confrontation before it gets all explosive, there's a nice like five minute scene where he's just talking to him. He's like, listen, Max, he's like, you don't remember me? And it's like, no, no, I, I got it. I got the name because he means well, but he, he saves yeah. so many people. He's just not going to remember everyone's name. But to Max, that's the most important thing. Like, I love those moments where it's just two characters talking. Like, I've always appreciated that. That's why we love Eternals yeah. so much because it's mostly that. It's not very action heavy. Um, right. But I think that's that's what I like about it. That's what's refreshing about it. Um, even though the, the plot structure is messy, I still think the moments between the characters are really nice. And I know you had kind of reacted earlier to the Sally Field scene, so I'll let you talk about it because it seemed like you were very excited for that. Well, I wanted to talk about this scene right off the bat. I wanted to be like, this is the best moment in the whole movie. But what I will say is that, once again, this is, an this is another moment in the movie that I feel just comes out of nowhere like she she's sitting she's in his room and he's like she's marveling at the wall that he has you know this scattered kind of like murder board CSI, of like yarn yeah. getting yeah like it's he you know he's trying to piece together seemingly like his family story i guess and she's like, this is what you've been doing. Like, you've been fantasizing about this idea of your father when, like, I've been the one raising you. Like, how am I not enough? Like, you're you're my boy. And, like, he's he's not even, like, a good guy. Like, you don't even really know your, who your father is. And she just has this beautiful, beautiful monologue. And they just bounce off of each other so well in that moment. Like, you're just watching two professionals at work in that scene. Mm -hmm. Um and and so I just think that it it's definitely just my favorite moment, and she's just so sweet. I want to. Yeah. yeah, and I do like how you do get hands. do do get a bit of redemption though, and you see that he did mean well, he did love his son. Like I love that moment where he watches back the video. Yeah. Like again, the character stuff in this thing is actually really good. It's just 
there's too much of it. Like there's too many characters mm-hmm. is the problem. Yeah, every single thread isn't interesting. Even if it was just about Harry and, and Peter, I think it'd be interesting. It's just, they're doing mm-hmm. that on top of the Max Peter stuff on top of the Gwen Peter and on top of the Peter and his dad stuff. I think if you do Peter and his dad with the Gwen stuff and then maybe the electro stuff, I think it works. Um, I think adding that extra added element of Harry is what overloads it. I think, mm-hmm. um, are there any other story things you want to talk about or any other castings um, of any of the other characters? I mean, Felicity Jones is in this for like a second. So random. And and so <laughs> underutilized. The same year she's nominated yeah. for an Oscar for Theory of Everything. She's practically useless in this. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, there was just one like story element that came out of nowhere where it's okay. like, Because, I don't know, I just feel like there was just, like, a lot of moving parts in this movie, as we've been saying. So we didn't get, like, I don't know, I never really got the sense that he was trying to piece together who his father was. Like, I just saw, you know, like, his wall and just assumed that that's what he was doing. And then he kept going back and forth with, like, the briefcase and, like, whether or not he wanted to, like, go through his dad's things. And then when he finally does, all all he really does is, like, tape up a picture of his family. By the way, this is such a, like, random complaint, but he does this, he has this moment, he, like, throws on his, like, he puts in his earbuds, he throws on his, like, iPod shuffle or whatever we had back in the year 2014, and he throws on Gone, Gone, Gone by Phillips Phillips, which is the worst needle drop, I think, in the history of needle drops. It was such an... (laughs) Such a bad misplaced song to use during that specific montage. Well, I mean, he's gonna love him long after he's gone, though, Kels. Yeah, but I hated it. <laughs> I'm I, no, I just didn't point. think it worked. So my friend Sky on, on Twitter, they are a big like American Idol fan. So like, I, whenever I tweet about American Idol, they they always message me with their thoughts. And they're doing this project where they're going back through old seasons and ranking the performances and stuff. And I was like, yeah, I'll help you out with that. So we've been doing, we did season 11, like literally two weeks ago, which was the Philip Phillips season. And when that little drop hit, I was like, oh my God, it's just so weird. Cause it's like, there was a time where it was like, who's the hottest star right now? It's, it's American Idol winner, Philip Phillips. Let's play the song. Right. And I'm like, it's just so random. But, but I, I think that's just the 2014 nature of it. That's like, yeah, you know, we just got to include it. And we can talk about the action superhero nature now because, like, I feel like a lot of it is fresh, but a lot of it feels like it hits the same beats. Like the the fact that both of the super super villain origins are essentially the same thing of like guys standing in the middle screaming and being consumed by whatever's changing them and turning their powers. I think is very funny um, because we've mm-hmm. seen so many different origin stories. Though I will say the Max Dillon electro sequence is pretty dang fun. Like the way he like yeah. gets electrocuted and then falls into a vat of eels. Like that is yeah. something that I think in the modern MCU realistic lens of like captain america the winter soldier people be like that's so stupid and corny but if you look at like the burton batman movies of like the 80s and yeah. 90s like, that fits right in with the batman of, of jack nicholson yeah. falling into the vat of acid and becoming the joker like that's a really cool like homage which i thought was really fun yeah i mean one of the first notes that i took on this film deal was that I was like this already it feels very comic booky like Mm -hmm. because we were getting the shots of like the dad working in the lab like he's killing all the spiders we get the big like the big like uh pan up shot of of the of the skyscraper he works in there's a lot of like the zoomy elements that like Mm -hmm. the like I feel like the more like the older comic book movies like all those elements that they had in it and that's Mm -hmm. the part that I really liked about it so I did So the electro moments and even in the action sequences, like with the in Times Square with the big red staircase and he's like catching the, you know, the cop, the he, you know, he's down one web shooter. And so now he's working with one web shooter to like stop the car from crushing everyone and then stopping the people from grabbing the handles and being electrocuted. Mm -hmm. Like it's it's really cool stuff. I have to think about how, if this was right before or right after Days of Future Past, but it's the same year. So they couldn't have known while making it that Days of Future Past would kind of take a similar device, but the very slow-mo sections, I mm. think it's cool because like the whole thing with electricity is it strikes so fast that I love how all the electricity stuff is slow-mo because it really mm-hmm. shows how quickly in the moment everything happens and if you, you can only really look at it if you slow it down. I really like that. It's a cool way to show off the action. And I like what you said about the comic book nature of it all because I think the colors really pop. I think his suit is extra red which helps i think electro Mm -hmm. being blue i don't love the design because it makes it look so fake and i don't like the adr Mm -hmm. where it's very clearly 
over recorded voice or they did something to his voice. It's kind of like the Venom thing, mm-hmm. but Venom is yeah. inside his head. Here it's like actually like he's speaking it. It looks a little weird, but yeah. I like how bright he is. I like the color. I like how green, you know, the Green Goblin stuff is. Like I like how all the like Gwen's blonde hair, like everything just really pops in this film, mm-hmm. which I really like. And I do like the slow mo, and I I do like how you kind of said with the comic bookness. Like if you see in a comic book some a character like punching another character, it's it's a picture. And I like how when we get these big collision moments, there's like there's like almost slow mos, and they kind of freeze in like a picture. Like I kind of like that. I I I, I do. Yeah. I think it's a fun fun unique style. And what I appreciated about this film, especially Dill, like you know, just direct directly comparing off of Tom Holland's movies, because like, like I said, they're the ones that I've seen the most. I feel like we never just get to watch Tom's Spider-Man just kind of like swing around and be in New York because he really hasn't been in New York a ton. No. We've seen him. We see in it the space. last two, we, the and, last two minutes of far from home, the first two minutes of no way home. Where he's with yeah. Zimbabwe. Literally. You know? Yeah. So to just watch this Spider-Man have just like a really fun swing sequence through through New York and have those kind of like POV shots where we're like swinging with him. I was like, I'm kind of into this. I'm like having a good time. And then like the rest of the movie happened and I was like, oh, wait, what happened? Um, <laughs> but yeah. going back to the action sequence with, um, with with when we get introduced to Electro. He, you know, obviously he zaps one of his uh, web shooters. And then this really doesn't come back until way at the end of the movie where he writes, I love you on the bridge. And they're having their sweet little bridge moment where he's like, we're not on different paths. You're my path. I love you. And then all of a sudden he's like, yeah, I don't know how I'm going to defeat him, though. Like he keeps frying my web shooters. And then instantly Gwen Stacy is like, oh, well, this is how you solve that problem. Where I'm like, why didn't this, like, why wasn't this like a trial and error? Like, why didn't I see him like sitting down and like working on it and like whatever? You know what I mean? Yeah, and and that might be just because we didn't watch the first one right before it. But I feel like the first one leaned into that a lot more with, because the villain of that is Kurt Connors, the doctor, the professor. So it's like, I think a lot of that was more about the science base of him like making the web shooters and stuff. But yeah, I would have liked a few more moments of him like sitting down trying to toggle with it. But I also like, I like that Gwen is the one who figures it out because it's like, yeah. it, it, it truly shows how they are now a partnership. He's kind of pushed her away this movie, even though he wants mm. her. Um, I actually texted, I think it was Carly and Matt this while watching it. Andrew Garfield is the only person to ever make stalking somewhat charming because there's a scene where she's like <laughs> telling him about this place. He's like, yeah, you love that place. And she's like, how do I, how do you know I love this place? And he goes, mm. um, I, cause you, you told me, she goes, it's only been home for a month. Meaning like they broke up before they, you know she started going yeah. here she's like have you been watching me and he's like uh he goes she goes how how often do you watch me he goes only once a day <laughs> and any other actor any other actor i don't care if you're daniel day fucking lewis yeah that's always going to be creepy but somehow andrew garfield yeah. makes me go i would get stuck by that guy you know like i really <laughs> do think yeah he's just so charismatic it's crazy yeah. And she yeah. is too, but it's crazy. And I, I I love that moment though, where she's like, "Have you tried a magnet?" And he's like, "Magnet? What? What? Oh, oh my god!" Like, like he's like almost no, so proud yeah. of her. Like, I just love it. I love it. I love it. Yeah. No. Yeah. Because there's just subtle elements of comedy in this film, Dill, which like really like come out of nowhere sometimes. Like that whole like moment where he sees her standing in like the park. Um, and he's just walking aimlessly through the traffic, like running by. And he like yeah. puts his hand up to stop a truck. <laughs> yeah. And then even as he's still walking, he's just in this daydream of like walking to his one true love. And like a car accident like, like happens the behind fuck out him. Of the way, man. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, okay. literally. And then there's like another moment where like right after the whole big like opening electro sequence in Times Square, they had they had just gotten done having the conversation where she's like, I'm probably gonna move to England. And he goes up to her and he's like, huh? So England, huh? And then just like huge crash behind him. They both don't flinch. And then he's like, gotta go. And I was just like, (laughs) wow, these moments of comedy like really sneak up on you in this Mm -hmm. film. And I think there's something to be said about the other um, type of like superhero movies where like the identities are kept secret. I love how she knows he's Spider-Man because it just Mm -hmm. lets it breathe it lets those moments where he goes she understands why it's not like why does you always keep leaving me like it's a different conflict mm. and the conflict is that his his dad her dad's death lingers on his mind and haunts him and he feels like 
he, he can't let anyone in and close because everyone he, he touches dies type deal. And th- that ends up being true, which is the saddest part of it. And, and we'll talk about that in a sec, because I think that is what makes this movie great. But I do think there's there's something interesting to be like, that's the driving factor is, is the haunting, haunting ghost of his dad, of her dad's death. Not the fact that he's Spider-Man. He can't tell her, you know, that's that's the driving mm-hmm. incident between him and Aunt May. But that's a very secondary thing. But I like how she knows he's Spider-Man. So that whole barrier is, is kind of erased you know it's kind of what makes no way home nicer because like ned and zendaya are just like there to help you know it's it, you don't have that mm-hmm. extra barrier of like you know and that's what makes the raimi films great but it's also like they already did it with the raimi films it's cool yeah. that this is doing something else um but yeah let's just talk about her death because i think that's the reason why i think this movie is so great is because it goes there and i know it's it's mm-hmm. weird to say like it's great because she dies but i think it really does make it really interesting because a lot of their stuff has been a lot more lighthearted. They're dealing with situations that are really t- tough and, and, and heavy on both their minds, but the way they interact is so light. So when it happens and you finally see her break quite literally and him break into tears, it is just one of the most amazing moments of acting in any movie, not just superheroes. And I think that really does show that if you watch it again with the lens of this being a tragedy, of like mm-hmm. this doomed romance that really they just really really wanted to make it work and they couldn't to where when they finally commit to making it work she dies like i think if you look mm-hmm. at it as that lens and you look at like electro being this tragic figure of someone who just wanted to fit in and when he finally gets his attention he destroys everything in his path and he has to be destroyed and you if you look at harry who just wants to like live up to his father's shoes and gets consumed like it's all about these tragic figures which i think is very interesting it makes the movie feel like it has a through line in the fact that like they all have these goals and ambitions and they all want to do so right, but they end up doing so much wrong. I think that's mm-hmm. where the, key of the film is. And I think it really is in that final moment where it all comes together. But like, what do you feel about this? Cause it's, it, we rarely see this in superhero movies where the lead we, I mean, we see it in a dead, yeah. but even then they, they retcon it so much, you know? Yeah. It's a real mature take on a superhero movie that I think was ahead of its time and a lot of people weren't ready for because even now we we see it time and time again even in the recent films that have come out it's that like at the end of the day like the heroes like 9.9999999 times out of 10 like they will overcome the evil and save who needs to be saved like the only time really where it got uh flipped was in endgame or well What'd infinity wars is when thanos wins well, I know, but I'm just saying, like, that's the movie where we lost Black Widow. Oh, gotcha. But they still win, is, is the point. They still defeat evil. But they still win. Infinity War is the only one where the evil wins. But but right. you make a good point. That's two exceptions. Like, Thanos wins in Infinity War, and in Endgame, we lose Tony and Natasha. But really, that's the only, like, yeah. permanent, like, big losses. And even Infinity War isn't permanent, you know? And, like, with this one, they're they're just you know, it's saying that, like, you can't always save everyone, no matter, like, how hard you try you know what i mean and i didn't realize how actually gruesome her death is because there's this added sound effect of her body literally snapping like her whole spine just like shattering and like her head like smack like hitting the concrete like it's rough I didn't like even I literally went. Hit. I thought it was just her back, but I guess her head does hit. Yeah. No, I think her head like sna- like <sighs> smacks the the floor, and I think that's part of it. And it, and it's especially it's especially harrowing because in his perspective, he's like, "Oh, great, I got her." So he doesn't even realize that anything's wrong until he gets down there, and he's like, "Oh, wait, let me take this off." Hey, what's happening? Why aren't you? Wait, stay with me. And then obviously I cried. Obviously. Simba and Mufasa. Can't. It's like, wake, wake up, wake up. You know, it's like, oh, yeah. And, and that's oh, where, don't. As, as much I'm, as he is, as much as he is an older Peter, in that moment, he's a little kid again. And it's mm-hmm. so sad. And, and that's the thing. That's why this movie works is because this whole time, as messy as it's been, it's still always been about Peter and his relationships and who he saves and who he doesn't save and, and his ability to try to save and make things work even when the universe is telling him it's not going to work, he still tries to make it work. My dad's still good. Even though AMA is telling me this, I still believe it. You know, Harry's still good. We just have to make sure he's, you know, you're still good in Harry. Even with Electro, he doesn't remember his name, but he's like, no, I hear you. I I, I believe you, buddy. Like, I believe there's something mm-hmm. wrong and like, we're going to help. We're going to try to help you. It's always been about trying to help, but sometimes mm-hmm. you just can't. And it's, oh, it's just so devastating. It's, I think it's legitimately what makes this movie great. If she doesn't I die, think- I don't think it's a good movie. Yeah. 
No, yeah, because then it's like it's just too perfect of an ending. It's too fantastical. Because you you uh, watch that whole movie, even though they're having this like, oh, well, we can't we can never be together kind of attitude. You know, like you just have the strangest inkling as an audience member that like they're going to end up together at the end of this film. And then yeah. they have this like twist ending on you that, yeah. you know, completely tears well, you up. And that goes into our third point, the action superhero nature. Again, superhero nature is like if you're broken up at the beginning, you're going to end up together at the end. And I love what you mm -hmm. just said. Like, it's like, you no, know, the whole time, especially when you're rewatching it, you, those little clues throughout, like can, when he writes on the sticky note, it's like, can this last? You're like, it's not going to. But not because you failed at a romance. It's because you're a superhero and you got in a battle. Like it has nothing to do with your personalities because you are meant to be together. And I think yeah. it's so sad when they when he finally writes that in, in the bridge because if he had just let her go to the airport, she's alive, you know? Or yeah. there's like a 99% chance she's alive, you know, because who knows, Electro could have shot her down in the sky with his electric bolt or whatever, his lightning bolt. Mm -hmm. But like, she probably makes it to London. They, She lives happily ever after. Maybe they rekindle in the future. But yeah. And the worst part yeah, of it. And, and, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. What's the worst part of it? <laughs> well, I'm going to segue into our last talking point. So I wanted you oh. to go first because, yeah. Okay. Well, what I was going to say is that. Honestly, when it comes to the action superhero stuff, the only stuff that I like with Max Dillon is that opening sequence in Times Square. And then everything else I can like do without. It's all just like memorable. Yeah. pretty, pretty colors, CGI, doesn't matter. The best part of the ending does happen with Harry, even though he should have came in way earlier. Like he flies in on his like little green goblin right. hoverboard and he's like doing his little laugh and he looks all scary. And then they have this whole fight in the clock tower, which I think is really, really cool, which really is cool all, set. All, yeah, you know, cool set ultimately is the reason why Gwen meets her demise. But I just love how, because Gwen is there, he's able to put two and two together and realize that like Spider-Man, like he's not just mad at Spider-Man. It's now a double portrayal because he's going Oh, why is Gwen Stacy here? Oh, Peter Parker. So not only did Spider-Man not help me save my life, this person who I called my friend helped me yeah. not save my life. And I like how he never says it. He never says, oh, you're Spider-Man, Peter. The audience knows. Because right. we're not dumb. Because we're not dumb. Yeah. And I think yeah. so many other movies, like if this was, no not, offense, if this was a Tom Holland movie, he'd be like, Peter, you're Spider-Man? You know? So yeah. I like how, like how the audience knows and we know we, you don't need to tell us. Um, but I was going to segue because I think it's so important when we talk about Andrew Garfield and, and that moment. I think the reason why this works even better now is when we talk about legacy and impact after seeing No Way Home and what he's able to finally conclude. Because the whole mm -hmm. frustration of this movie for a lot of people also as well is that they made this movie knowing there'd be a third one. Because they figured this is going to be a smash hit. Everyone's going to love this movie. Of course, it's going to win a million Oscars and we're going to greenlit a third one. That's why in the very final scene, they're like, let's introduce a brand new big bad villain in the end. Even though we kind of Played saw him Played by Paul too. Giamatti. Played by Mr. Holdover. Yeah, but um, <laughs> yeah, they're like, let's just tease this new villain. They even go through the whole like Sinister Six thing. You see Vulture's thing. You see, uh, who's the other one? There's Doc another. Oct. Doc Ock. yeah. You see Doc Ock, Vulture, and then uh, it's assumed that it's going to be Doc Ock, Vulture, Rhino, maybe like they would introduce venom at this point i don't remember what it was gonna be but they're very yeah. clearly setting up the sinister sticks for number for film three and i think film three would have been a lot of him trying to deal with gwen with this introduction of shailene woodley as mj problem is mm -hmm. the movie bombs i don't know if it was mm -hmm. a very critical hit or a very big uh, box office hit but it critically bombed people didn't like it and then they never made a third one and then disney got the mcu cooking and they were able to greenlight the Spider-Man movie for 2016 for Civil War two years later. So it was really just kind of like, yeah, no, this is it. We're not getting a third one. And I think that made it worse for so many people in the time because they were like, well, if we're not getting another one, then w w what is all this? Because then his his quick change back into Spider-Man is so quick. He didn't have the time to process, but we don't have a whole nother film to kind of go through this grieving with him. So it just feels like she dies. And then the, the little kid thinks he can beat the rhino and then 
he's spider-man's like no little kid i got it um and then they start right. fighting and then that's it and like that's the last we see of him so i kind of like how no way home exists as a way to give us that final closure for garfield sure. i think that's some of the strongest stuff in that movie that movie we both kind of talked about we don't like it with more and more years that pass we're just kind of like mm-hmm. a little bit more mid on it but i think what mm-hmm. it does so well is resolving this arc because we never got that final closure of andrew garfield spider-man when he catches zendaya it's like it's like that that weight is lifted off his shoulders for good and i really like yeah um so i i think this movie is was made worse in the fact that they never got to make the third movie but is made Mm -hmm. better by the fact that they gave us that closure for andrew garfield so now that moment feels like it has you know it feels like it's been put at peace you know yeah i will say dill like re re rewatching this did make me want to go back to no way home just so i could you know like end his arc in my heart um But I just feel like going back on it, like I said, I watched it three years ago. I watched it again, literally today. And I just like my opinion of it kind of soured a little bit. And that almost makes me think that like, as the years continue to go on, like, I I just don't like see this. Like, I, like I said, I could really sympathize with all the people who walked away disliking this movie and thinking that it was kind of like a bloated mess because that's how I kind of view it now. And so as far as like legacy and impact goes, I'm like, well, it kind of did have, it had an impact, whether or not if it was negative or Mm -hmm. positive, like it kind of leans more negative than I feel positive. Um, And when you talk about just what has come since we got three Tom Holland movies, plus civil war, plus infinity War, plus end game, plus, um, the two animated Spider-Verse movies. So we've gotten so much Mm Spider-Man since that I feel like with more and more time, I think the good thing about this is it's getting a little overshadowed to where this is no longer like the one Mm -hmm. on everyone's minds to poke fun at. It's Mm kind of like Spider-Man three was done a service by this because Spider-Man three for so long, people were like, Oh, this sucks. And then with time, people were like, "Eh, it wasn't that bad. And I feel like with time, it's kind of doing it to this film as well, where they're like, it's not that bad. Um, and I think it is just because Garfield and Stone do such a good job together. And I think also when mm-hmm. we talk about legacy, I think he's become a bigger star since I think no way mm-hmm. home helped people realize that he is one of the three and you can't just say it was Toby, Tom, and then the guy in the middle, like he is a Spider-Man and he did a good job. And he's honestly the, of the three, if we're just looking at who's the best actor period, I think Garfield's the best actor of the three, maybe not mm-hmm. in specifically the Spider-Man role, but I think he's the best actor of the three. Um, and I, I think if you look at just superhero films in general, I think there's a lot of superhero films that do even worse with bloated messes. Like, I think this at least still has a really strong central relationship that it makes it feel important still, even if it's mm-hmm. messy, which I think is something to be said that at the time, I think it it honestly may, might have looked even worse. But I think with time, I've, I've kind of appreciate it more because there's been stuff I don't like since. Like, I, I honestly probably would rewatch this before I watch like maybe no way home but i don't know Mm. you know Uh, maybe homecoming um i I still like far from home a lot but that's the one other people Mm -hmm. don't like so i'm I'm on the way minority with spider-man because a lot of people are like homecoming and no way home are great far from home sucks and i'm kind of like i kind of like far from home the best of those three and i kind of like this yeah all those three um i still think the first amazing spider-man for for me just because the villain is so forgettable for me is is probably the worst of all of them but I do sure. think I, I don't know. I think this one just sticks landing so well, not sticks landing. It's a bad choice of words, but mm. just really succeeds in that relationship so well, and in the Aunt May mm-hmm. storyline so well that I think I, I don't know. I I really do dig it. But yeah, Dale, that's just like going back to the first thing I said was because they wanted to focus on this relationship, which is the strongest of the plot lines. They should eliminate should have had eliminated one of the villain plot lines. And yeah. I think it we could have had a really good, strong film. Which one would, would you have removed of the two? I If I had to make this film a perfect film, I would have just made it about him and Gwen, Gwen Stacy and Harry Osborn. Okay. And I would have eliminated cool. Max like, Dillon. I agree. I agree. Uh, and now, last thing with Legacy and Impact, do you like the version we saw of Jamie Foxx? Because they really tried, of all the characters, to make him give him a complete 180 in no way home do you like that version better? yeah than looking back on it like he kind of has like he's kind of like a little bit like cooler in, in no really way cool. home yeah i think yeah that's i thing. mean yeah i mean i think you can be a cool actor and then like also like you know play a more character type of person i think that's yeah. why i didn't you really and I. mind <laughs> <his work. laughs> yeah uh, yeah we're, cool actors too. yeah we're the coolest we, people we know we got obviously suave. um no, yeah, that's a good point, though. But, like, I, I really like how they tried to at least make him a little more subdued, a little less. 
because he's just a lot. It's a lot. Every time Electra's on yeah. the screen, it's a lot visually, aesthetically. Um, yeah. What are your final thoughts before we well, let's we'll go through the final beats one more time? But any any other thoughts on this? Um, well, Dill, I wanted to ask you a question. I mean, obviously, I think that at this point, ten years later, it's it's not going to happen. But do you think that? Um, do you would you want a spot an Amazing Spider-Man three and two? Do you think like it would do anything for this franchise or for future Spider-Man projects? He might be too old, but honestly, he hasn't aged really at all. It might work. I, I I think the problem is that Sally Field has aged a bunch, and I just don't know if I I, I feel like now that we've our ship has sailed with Tom Holland, I really just don't see them ever going back to this unless it was a Venom movie or a movie about a mm. villain where he came in as like almost like a supporting roller cameo. Like I don't think it could never. Mm. I don't think we could have another Peter Parker movie with Andrew Garfield as Peter. I just don't think it'll happen. Um, but I would I would love to see it just to see that closure. But even then, like. I think his story had a really nice ending in No Way Home. Um, and even in this story, like I, I feel like it's a tragic ending, but I don't know the, the the poetry of him seeing the grave every day. And and yes, he gets back into fighting as Spider-Man at the end, but it is still almost out of sadness. Like that little kid standing there, it's almost kind of, you know, the symbol of like hope, like maybe it's time to pass it on, but also like mm. you still need to be there for the little guy type deal, quite literally, which I yeah. like. So it's 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 different, but I also hate the Rhino ending where it's like, do I really want that to be the ending of this guy's journey? I don't know. Right. Well, I honestly don't even really mind like viewing this ending as kind of like the actual ending of of his plot of you know his movies, just because like you know it doesn't have to be all like summed up like in a in, like you know wrapped up in a neat little bow. Ever like ever I after, think that yeah. it's fine to like have it kind of like oh and then the adventures of spider-man like still continue on like to this day yeah. kind of thing you know what i mean yeah, yeah. No, I yeah, really it's difficult. It. yeah. I, I mean yeah i i've i've always gone to bat for this film because i do think it does so much well that people like to focus on the messy stuff but i'm not going to ignore that it is messy it is clunky and i do think mm-hmm. it might just be that they they were like well we're gonna get a third one to kind of like let things breathe but it's like if you don't get that third one it feels even extra bloated because like this is also your resolution for it all um but let's quickly just go through acting and casting you gave it a five out of five i'm gonna give it a four out of five just because i still think jamie fox is maybe miscast um and okay. i do still think there are you know some acting moments that i don't love from him um but otherwise i think it's almost perfect uh what were you what about like the story beats and the writing for you that one's not as good I, gave, as I, imagine. I gave that a two out of five that's my lowest okay. scoring yeah. I, I would say three out of five because i still really like the gwen peter stuff but uh, I, I I see that uh, action superhero nature. I, I think, like I said, I really like how it does feel like a comic book. And I do think some of the action is really inspired, even though it's not necessarily anything super innovative. So I gave it like a 3.5 out of five. Oh, I gave it a three out of five. There you go. Uh, what about the the filmmaking itself? We didn't really get into it too much, but it kind of goes hand in hand with the action a little bit. But like, uh, how, how right. well was it filmed? Um, I also gave that a, a solid three out of five. I thought yeah, that, I would, you know, wasn't doing anything exceptional, but it wasn't right. bad. Yeah, I, I think it's much more aesthetically pleasing than some other films of its kind. And Legacy and Impact, mm-hmm. I I mean, it's it's hard. I don't think this film had a great legacy or impact, but I think the legacy and impact of Spider-Man, the franchise, has made this slightly better. So I guess I'd give that like a four out of five, um, but I don't really know how to rate that. I went straight <laughs> down the middle, Dill. I went straight 2.5 out of five, just because I was like, that's, that's a difficult question yeah. to answer. So, so yours averages out to maybe what, like a three, you would say, or, or out of ten, what would you give this? Like, what, what's your letterbox rating going to be? Out of ten, or should I do out of five stars, like on letterbox? Well, yeah, I, I guess you could do out of five stars. I mean, technically, five five out of five is ten. Four point five out of five is nine. Four out of five is eight. So oh, it still matches up out of ten. Okay, I can't. So do if you were to give something like a five that. a five out of ten, it's two and a half stars. If that makes sense. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. So just give us a um, start, and, and I'll I'll tell you what it is out of ten. <laughs> <laughs> I would probably give this. I'd probably hit it right in the middle. I'd say two point five stars. All right, so it's about a five out of ten for you. Yeah, that's that's yeah. fair. I would probably go a little higher. I'd go like three and a half stars or three stars. I, I really think it's it's solid enough for me. Um, I just think I'm just so smitten with you know that relationship. Um, and, and yeah, I think it it really works. And and you've honestly made me realize why Max Dillon's a little bit better than I thought he was. So actually I like it more than I did 
an hour ago. So um, very You're fun. Welcome. So that's our, our brief little review. Again, we, we didn't want to do a whole commentary for it, especially because we're not as well versed in the film. So we didn't want to just sit there and talk about a film that we haven't seen as much. So this is a fun way to do it. Um, we do have something related to Days of Future Past, but we have already reviewed it here. So we're, instead of doing a Days of Future Past review, we are going to instead talk about who we would cast as the X-Men of the MCU, assuming they recast some roles, assuming we may even see some of them as early as Deadpool, baby. Um, so in case we do, we'll tell you who we think we should play, like the core group that we see in the X-Men animated series and some in X-Men Days of Future Past, but who we would cast as, you know, Magneto, Wolverine, Professor X, all those characters, even if it's no one or everyone. Um, I don't know how it could be everyone, but everyone's playing Magneto. Um, but that is going to be our like our next big video, but we will next week be back with trivia, so stay tuned. Um, there will be two matches in the next trivia match. Uh, trivia, trivia tournament as we fi uh, finalize our finale for that, um, and then the next week we'll do the X-Men video. But Kels, anything else from you here? Um, nothing from me, just um, thanks for watching, and subscribe to the Dill Pickle Movie Network, and yeah. um, like this video, and comment your thoughts on the amazing spider-man 2 are you an amazing spider-man 2 apologist or do you hate it um and kelsey i will ask because uh we may or may not see you on the desk uh it's always tough with trivia getting kelsey yeah. and three competitors uh, schedules together so she has graced us with the permission of if we need to go if i need to ride solo without her um but she still writes all the questions so her presence will still be felt in the match but I'm talking as if you're like a ghost. Um, but I just okay. gotta ask Zach versus Eric versus Jeremy. Who you got? Oh, that's tough. That's a tough one. I mean, I will go. Ah, I don't want to pick anyone. <laughs> you have to give a name. Just give a name. Don't give a reason. Just say a name. I really want to watch him succeed. So I am going to say Zach just because okay. I'm rooting for him. Okay. Next match, Chad versus Alec versus Tyler. Oh, God. Oh, God. I know. Okay. You're picking between I... the host of the channel, but you're also picking between the guy that Joe Fairley himself said he, he expects to see versus another member of Secret Tunnel, Jake Tato's partner, Alec. What are we going to do here? I'm going to go with Alec. Okay. So there we go. Kelsey thinks Zach and Alec are going to be facing off against Joe. So we will see how that goes. Um, there you go. Kelsey shot her shot. Y'all get mad at her, not me. Uh, I didn't say anything. Um, you know, just for fun, just for fun, I'll say Eric and Tyler. Why not? Which means naturally right. Jer Jeremy and Chad are going to win. Um, but no, right. that's, that's not, <laughs> there, there we go. So you're not the only one throwing names right now. Um, but that's going to be right. the matchups for next week. We'll see you then. Thanks for watching. As Kelsey said, leave all your comments. Let us know um, what you thought of Amazing Spider-Man 2 if you revisited it. If you didn't, do it. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye. <laughs>